All right, so good morning, everyone, and welcome to our November 1st PTO meeting. And we have a great agenda today. We're going to get started pretty quickly because we have a lot of our faculty members, students as well, who are participating. So they're kind of managed by a time schedule a little bit more than some of us are. And, you know, before we do introduce the first group, I just want to send a quick thank you to our PTO for providing some nice Hall Halloween treats yesterday. Definitely a plus on a, a, a holiday that fell on a Monday. So Jan, thank you for dropping those off. We certainly appreciate the support. And on behalf of the staff, I just wanted to thank you and the PTO for the ongoing support. We truly appreciate it. Now, are, we are tweaking the agenda. We're not removing any items, but because we have a student group that's actually in a class this period, we are going to be introducing our first group, which is robotics and our VEX competition. That's from Mr. Amenta, who is one of our robotics teachers, and Mr. Grenier, who also teaches in the department, but he is also the program coordinator. I would like to thank both in advance for their work. I'm looking forward to the VEX competition coming up. Mr. Grenier, I'm going to turn it over to you at this time and to Mr. Amenta. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Mr. Menta's got a mute. So I uh, just wanted to say, you know, thank you for the opportunity to let us present. Mr. Menta and a couple of his students are going to talk about our competition, which is on the 12th of this month. So I'm going to leave that to you, Mr. Menta. This one, you got to mute that. Good. Turn off the speaker. All right, um, we've got three different cameras going on here. So for those of you that don't know me, my name is Mr. Menta. I am the teacher, CTE teacher for robotics and then also the coach for the robotics team. Um, what you're looking at here on the field is this year's VEX game, which is called Spin Up. Um, guys, you can come on up to the field. We've got two robots on the field right now from uh, one of my, or actually two of my teams that, uh, competed with us on Saturday. We just got back from Hall High School where we competed with over 30 kids and six robots. Um, so yeah, so this year's game is called Spin Up. If you guys wanna start moving the robots around the field, you can. <clears throat> Basically what they have to do is they have to pick up yellow discs and either score them in certain zones or put the um, discs into the high goals, which are basically like, kind of like Frisbee golf if you ever saw that. Uh, plus, there's rollers around the field, so depending on what color the roller is at the end of the match, they get points for that. Um, what you're seeing, again, is just basically two robots practicing on the field. Normally, on a competition, there'll be four robots on the field, uh, and the match is about a minute and a half long with autonomous periods, which the students have to program the robot, and driver control periods where they get to, to drive and, and obviously score points. On November 12th, we're going to be hosting here at Daniel Hand High School, and we will have three fields set up in the gym for competition. We'll have one field set up for skills, and then we'll have another field set up for practice with over 60 teams attending this year from Rhode Island, Massachusetts, Connecticut. Um, and I think we even have a team from New York also showing up. So it should be an all day event. Um, obviously it's free. We will have concessions out in the courtyard serving hamburgers and hot dogs with my, uh, my awesome parent volunteers. Um, and just come on down for a, a full day of competition robotics. Any questions? So Mr. Amenta, if I was going to attend the competition on November 15th, what would be a good time for me to attend? Um, so it's Saturday, November 12th. Oh, November 12th, sorry. Yeah, basically the teams get there anywhere between seven and eight. Um, driver meeting is usually at nine. Um, alliance, or excuse me, uh, qualifying matches start between 9.30 to about 1.30. And then the, the elimination tournament is about 1.30 to 3.30. So pretty much any time during the day, if you want to see the main, you know, part of the action, probably be between 10 and 1 o'clock. 
Thank you, Mr. Armenta. Any other questions? You can see the rest of my class kind of working and paying attention in the background. Great. Well, we're certainly exciting, excited to host in November and only a couple of Saturdays away. We usually have great attendance. You know, COVID's not impacting attendance, which is excellent. So usually hundreds of people supporting all of the teams that visit from various schools in Connecticut are in attendance. So if you have a, a little free time, it's definitely a worthy event to attend. Mr. Grenier, anything you want to add? No pressure if it's no, but just giving you that opportunity. I'm all good, thank you, TJ. All right, so really exciting opportunity. And again, thanks for hosting. And Mr. Grenier and Mr. Amenta, thank you for taking the lead with this competition. It certainly gives our students a really exciting experience. And we're looking forward to November 12th. And again, November 12th, I think November 15th was previous years. All right, so moving on our next topic, Mr. Rice is back by popular demand to talk about our fab lab. Mrs. Fiorelli is unfortunately not in today, but if you recall, if you attended last month's PTO meeting, we did kind of a abbreviated tour of our new fab lab. And in speaking with some parents and definitely some students, it's a, it's a high level interest area in our school. And we asked Mr. Rice if he would be interested in having students showcase a little bit of what they're doing in there in relation to what can be done in the Fab Lab and in connection with one of our required courses for graduation, which is the independent project. So Mr. Rice, thank you for your time. And I'm gonna stop talking and turn this opportunity over to you. All right. Uh, hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Give me a thumbs up if you, okay, great. That's good, uh, good to see. And today we're gonna do another tour of the Fab Lab. If I swivel this camera around, uh, there's a whole setup, a whole rig we've got going here from Fab Lab Equipment. If we swivel this around, you should be able to see that there are some students in the room doing things, and we're gonna get a nice little tour of projects so that you can see what's going on. And first up, we've got Mary Claire. Hi, I'm Mary Claire Pantano, and I'm doing CNC machinery. So it's basically when you use this machine that has a milling tool to carve things and to create things. So this is something Mr. Rice made out of wood. Everything that I've made so far is at my house because uh, it's either gonna come with me to, be, to Virginia where I can um, sand it down with things that the machine can't like do to perfect tools or like I finished it, so it's at my house. Uh, so you use this program, which is Carbide Create to design what you're going to make in the machine. And then this is carbide motion and you use it to, um, and you use it to move the machine. So you can use, so basically what carbide create does is it makes G code. And then when you put it in carbide motion, it moves the machine around uh, by telling it the jog pattern. So, we can move the machine right here manually. X, Y, and then Z is up and down. And that would be how you create something on this machine. Yep, thanks Mary Claire. Thank you. Uh, here's examples of things that we've made. You know, this is carved into a block of bamboo. There's all sorts of cool examples that students have made. It can cut wood like Mary Claire showed and also plastic and then metal. We're gonna make a plastic wood and metal CNC, so it'll be fun to look at. So that is our first of these different things. And now we're gonna move on to the sewing area over here. And we've got two students, Addie and Senna. So. I'm Addie. And I'm Senna. Um, so I'm using the sewing machine uh, for my independent project and um, proved to be very useful. Um, Personally, I'm making a fashion line, but I have made a couple things. Uh, like I've made a couple iterations of like uh, early on clothes. I've made pillows. Uh, we've had a friend that made a doll. Um, yeah. And so you like using the machines? They work well. Mm -hmm. And have you ever used this 
before? Before this, only like a few years ago to hem things uh, and things such as that with my mom. But my project actually doesn't consist of using the sewing machine. But after I saw Addy using it so often, I got really interested in the machines and we eventually got another one so that more people would be able to use them. And personally, um, it's since it's for my project, I had to learn how to sew. Like I never knew how to like sew. This first time using my sewing machine, and the learning curve uh, was fairly easy. And I really enjoy using it, and it's fun to do. And I'm considering buying my own. All right, thank you, ladies. Uh, I'm gonna scoot right by you here, and so we're gonna keep going with our tour. It's really neat to see that. Each of these students are doing these projects mostly for their independent project, but then some are showing up like Senna who just have interest. Um, there's a few stations where I'm gonna do the introductions. This is our electronics bench and we've got all sorts of things that you can do on the electronics bench. Over here, we've got um, an Arduino setup. This is a fun little example. You can see some blinky lights here. This is a system that'll measure how far away you are that uh, a student could set up and have in, in some of my classes. Another cool thing that's available is students nowadays can design and then order their own circuit boards. And I know that's blurry, um, but this is a circuit board and for about $20, you can go from a design to something ordered and shipped to you from China, or there's a few fab houses in, I think there's one in Connecticut and a couple in Oregon. So students can be designing and building their own circuits. All right, we're gonna keep sort of wandering around for our tour. And as we go through, there's some example things. We've got sort of our project shelf over here. Uh, we've, we've pulled a few things off. And then we've got a big Promethean and we've got a green screen area. This is a fun spot. So this will be a good video asset for later, um, but you can, kids can record things. We've got lighting and cameras and those sorts of things to work with this area so that lots can happen. Um, over here, we had, I had a senior lined up, but uh, they seem to be out today for unexpected reasons to show off our music area. Over here, we have a keyboard that works great if you know how to play music. And so students, I have multiple students whose independent projects are about recording music. And so they're able to use our MIDI keyboard input and our, uh, our inputs here so that they can record all sorts of things. And it's just a nice audio sampling setup. So they're able to work with that sort of stuff. Okay, next up, we have a student named Nicole. And can you tell us what you're up to? Um, hello, I'm Nicole. So I'm sort of interested in architecture. So I was able to download this software called Revit, which is like what real architects use. Um, so, so far I've created like a 3D plan of a house. Um, Revit allows you to do like floor plan views, like over here and like add walls and you can design down to like each component like even like a couch cushion for like interior design so it's really cool but it's taken a while to make each like part of it um so this is like a few examples of what i've done so far i've started with the kitchen um this is like i'm just starting now to design like level two and here's level one over here so like and you can add like stairs and everything and we might um make like a 3d model Here's, so this is not Nicole's, but this is a model of another house that another student has made. So we're able to use some of our other tools. This was cut on the laser out of cardboard and it came right out of Revit. So, thank you. All right, and so we have a few other things going on over here. Uh, we've got, let me point the camera in a reasonable direction. We've got, um, students working on an independent project, you know, it is first period. So here's Matt doing his thing and you just say hi. And then we've got another student who's building a 3D printer and we modded it out. We've, we printed 3D parts in green. So the 3D printers are themselves partially 3D printed. We've got Ethan over here who's making video games. We'll just sort of, Ethan, you want to wave? Say hi. There we go. Excellent. And then over here, we've got a lot happening in this corner. Here's Jack who's building a car for independent project. So this is my car. So I mostly made the parts using this 3D design software called Onshape. So I designed the parts and I print them with the 3D printers. And what I'm using to power the car is this DeWalt battery that I use for like power tools and stuff for my house. And then I ordered all these components like the Arduino Uno to control, to get the code from the computer to control the wheels so I can make it drive. 
So. And it, and it drives, right? Yeah, it does drive, and it goes really fast. But it's disassembled and, at the moment. <laughs> yeah, I was in the middle of changing the chassis out for a new one. So that's where I'm at now. Cool. Great. Thank you very much, Jack. Uh, next up, we've got two fellows who are resident expert 3D printers. They may have been the inspiration for the middle school makerspace, and now they're going to tell you about our 3D printing setup here. Uh, I'm Kevin. And I'm Griffin. And so this is the uh, 3D printing area. There's uh, three 3D printers and, and definitely more to come. Uh, I'm really happy that we were able to get these here because I've been 3D printing for you know a lot of time. And it's, I've learned a lot along the way from it. Yeah, like the way this works is like you get this. Right now we're using this material called PLA polyacetic acid, which is a pretty easy material to print, to like, material to print out with our setup. So, oh, so the extruder right here, this heats up the plastic and then there's like a little nozzle at the end that deposits the filament in a way that the computer controls, like the 3D printer controls. And then it lays it down precisely to make like stuff. So it's melted plastic. So in order to start with this, you need to actually have a 3D model that you can either oh, you can either find online or create yourself. Like for example, Jack had created his own uh, RC car setup here, uh, which he designed and then put into a software called a slicer, which cuts it into layers, which the 3D printer can then compute and extrude onto the heated platform where it prints, which is happening on all three printers. So you can make a lot of cool things you can find uh, like for example, this is a uh, tiger to represent Daniel Hannah High School, printed in gold filament. That took 17 hours to print. Yeah, there's also, I mean, on top of the cool, very artsy prints, there's a lot of practical uses. Uh, you can make your own RC car. You can make your own, I guess this is RC planes. You can make... Uh, the, are those mounts? Yeah, spool mounts that can hold the... 3D filaments easier. That was one issue that we had a lot here. So that's in the process of being built. Yeah, like this also, apart from it being cool, helps us reduce costs by like making stuff inside of like the school instead of having to buy specific components. We'll just make them and design them here to like to fit our needs. Cool. All right. Uh, thank you guys very much for showing off what you're up to with the 3D printers. That is great. Um, scroll past our storage era area and here's Here's Ava, who's going to tell us about our vinyl plotter. I'm Ava, and um, this is our vinyl cutter. And here we um, we use Adobe Illustrator to design to make our designs, and you can pretty much make whatever. And then you put it on these. Those are big rolls of vinyl. Over, I don't know if you can see them over there. And then these sheets of vinyl get put here, and then our images get cut onto them. And then you can make stickers. So we have some stickers like these and then these and they're they've been used to make a lot of posters and signs around the fab lab and whatnot and it's pretty cool to see your designs come to life. Oh, you can also it doesn't only cut but you can also put pens inside to make your um, designs drawn out, which is I imagine helpful for other projects. Yes, this was drawn. This was a sewing template that was drawn with a ballpoint pen. Oh, this is a sewing template that was drawn with a, a ballpoint pen for Addie's project. So, yeah, we've got lots of cool stuff. Um, I'm going to walk around. There's a couple things that we need to still button up. Can I scooch past your bag here? Thank you. Um, and so a few things for us left to look at. There's another area for us to consider the one the one cool item and maybe it's my some of my favorite items we've got over here sorry the camera's right at me uh one cool feature we have for our art students are these drawing tablets so these a student can pick up and draw right on and so here you can see this is some digital art sort of if i hold it in the right light um sydney glasgow a senior who's out today she draws this fantastic artwork on this tablet she can just use this pen as an input for the computer, and she just goes to town with Photoshop and Adobe Illustrator, so she can draw out these things. I watched her make this fish in in like less than an hour. This painting of a lady also, and that's a great way for her to generate digital art. She's in an AP art class and would really like to do digital art in the future. Um, another thing about all these skills, so we're able to sort of modify and find 
different things. We've been putting up posters like this yellow one, and I know it's too far away to read, but this is a list of all of the related courses. So if a, if a kid is interested in something like Mary Claire is interested in the CNC machine, this is a list of all of the different classes in the high school she could take in order to learn more about how to use the CNC machine and how to deepen and expand her skills. So we're excited about that, that this really connects to the curriculum students have in other areas uh, and how that can all fit together. And then our last machine, as we do the, the lap and a half around the lab, this is the laser. Uh, and so the laser is sort of a big tool. It's, the, it's a big item. This is also governed by design in Adobe Illustrator, just like Abel was working at. The laser is able to do all sorts of fun things. It's able to cut through and engrave um, wood material. And so you can see here, we've, we've done this into wood. We made nice little branded coasters. You can take wood and cut slats in it and it can curve and be put together. So there's some really interesting things that you can make. This is sort of a pencil holder and uh, you can, engrave into metals and onto glass. So this is a flat glass coaster as sort of demo projects. Here it is in an anodized aluminum sign. So if you wanna make little messages over here, we've got the ability to go into leather and it stopped midway through with that. Um, cardboard works really well. There's a, a nice looking fish, um, but there's some graphic design skills that you gotta to learn to make this work well. But a really cool one that we're excited about are uh, the fact that we have a roller. So we can put a, a glass like this and put some branding on it. So this is a neat way for kids to make things available for like a fundraiser if they wanted to, or we're actually giving these away. We have a, a NIASC coming to visit and talk about school things. So we're gonna give these away as, as gifts to people who are coming to visit. And so we're really excited about the ability for students in the independent project class and in marketing classes and other places to be able to use these tools to build their ideas, to make them into something that's useful and fun. And get it. we find that it gets kids interested to come in and say, I wanna learn a new thing, which is a, always, a good, always a good attitude to have in a school. So um, that is the whirlwind tour of the lab. And I'd love to answer any questions that you all have. Just a reminder, if you have a question, just unmute yourself and jump right in. Hi, it's Jan. Um, I wondered where all the supplies come from and how the, the students get the supplies. That's a, that's a great question. Um, we're currently working out the long-term budget, but luckily this summer, I, I myself received a grant for being a nationally recognized maker educator, which I'm very proud of. Uh, and so we have a little bit of temporary funds to make sure that we can jumpstart in a way that's really useful. And a, a, neat off, uh, a neat opportunity that Mr. Salutary has worked out for our independent project students is that they're able to apply for a $50 grant for many of them. And, and we're not, you know, the long-term viability now that every kid is doing that, we still need to work out some details. So I don't wanna hold Mr. Salutary to that. Uh, but it's something that we're happy when a, when a kid says that they need $50, um, that we can help in that way. You know, I grew up under the poverty line and it's important as, for me personally that kids who need just a little push to make a cool project that we, that we get them there. So, any other questions, follow up? I, I, I have a question. Are yeah. all of the independent projects conducted through this particular lab or are there independent projects that happen through other ways in the school? Oh. Yeah, that's a great question. The independent project class doesn't have to use this lab at all. We're just housing all of the classes like right next to this. So what we find is about 50% of our students want to use the lab with their project. Uh, and a lot of the time it's with a skill that they already have. Like our, we have many kids making videos and lots of them have learned that skill in Mr. Arsenault's class. And then they're using it with equipment that we bought in the lab to better enable them to do that without needing to interrupt Mr. Arsenault's first period class. So we're, we're trying to do that, but there are plenty of students that are, that are just doing their work without the lab, um, but we're housing all of the classes right, right in this corner of the library. So it's available. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Good questions. And Mr. Rice, I just wanted to thank you and your students first for your navigation skills. It was pretty impressive walking <laughs> around the classroom and managing a microphone and a camera. 
just a uh, final note. I mean, this is our first trimester with a fab lab. You know, Mr. Rice presented this last year and turned a vision into a reality and it's been incredible thus far. And, you know, every student is required to take independent projects to graduate. It's part of our profile of a graduate. They have all of these resources available as an option. And Jan, your question's perfect. We try and support what students need. So what we, Mr. Rice and I are working on a budget proposal for following years that we'll present to the Board of Ed, but we also have funds available where there's another skill where students have to apply to me directly in writing to justify up to $50 in expense. And that's been a really exciting part of the process as well. So I'm sure we'll invite Mr. Rice back to some PTO meetings and we are actually considering having a parent night and we're working out some details because several parents have expressed some interest in getting in that lab and seeing how things work. So more to come on that topic, but Mr. Rice, really cool stuff, great work. Definitely appreciate it. And please thank all your students as well. Absolutely. And thank you. Uh, one thing that may be an update since our last meeting is we're officially uh, the third registered fab lab in the state and the first one in any secondary school, uh, any, any school at all across Connecticut. So it's a fun celebration. That's awesome. You have to use one of those machines to highlight that, Mr. Yeah, Rice. we got to make a big sign, I guess. That's awesome. <laughs> Congratulations. Great work. Definitely appreciate it. Thanks. All right, so very exciting Fab Lab information. Our next topic, lots of exciting topics today. And we have our two advisors for our advisory program. Mr. Ron Spears, Ms. Catherine Kennedy have done an incredible amount of work over the last year or so to get advisory up and running. And we're really excited for them to be present today to share where advisory has started and where we plan to be going in the near future. So Ron and Catherine, welcome to our PTO meeting and the floor or the Zoom floor is yours at this time. Good morning, thanks for having us. I am Catherine and like Mr. Salutary said, uh, Ron Spears and I are the co-advisors for advisory. Last year, we really spent um, the year gathering data, um, conducting research, and investing in professional development for our faculty to feel comfortable leading advisory and kicking it off this year. And this fall, we have kicked off our advisory program. Um, overall, the big idea is that social and emotional learning is essential for all students to be successful in the classroom and in life overall. Um, at the, the core of that or the foundation is relationships. And so first and foremost, advisory is about developing trusting relationships between adults in the building and students and among students themselves. It also um, is to support social and emotional activities and lessons that are important and pertinent to our student body. And advisory right now is student driven based on student feedback and input, but we'll explain this morning how we're really working to make it not just student driven, but as student run as possible. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> I could just talk to you uh, for a few minutes about the, uh, the structure of advisory and, and uh, kind of how it looks in practice. Um, for the most part, uh, every Wednesday, with some exceptions here and there, we have a, a 20 or 30 minute advisory period where students um, meet with their group, uh, which they'll be with throughout, throughout the entire four years that they're here. If they're seniors, obviously this is just going to be their only year, but um, the goal is to keep that group together throughout their entire journey through hand. Um, and they engage in different activities each week. Um, uh, you, set, you almost exclusively centered around those, those social and emotional skills that, um, that Mrs. Kennedy brought up. Um, and we typically, after that 20 or 30 minute block, um, then have what's called Wellness Wednesday, which I'm sure probably most of you are familiar with. Um, and students are then, you know, they have that entire hour to do this. Sorry, I don't know if you guys can hear the announcements in the back. 
They're muffled, Ron. So you can. They're muffled. Okay, good. Yeah. Uh, yep. So at, uh, that that entire hour on Wednesday is dedicated to building that you know community, building that social emotional support, um, and it's from the feedback we've gotten so far from students and staff. Um, I think it's being well received, and people seem to really um, appreciate the value of it and 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 enjoy the experience with the students. To add on to what Ron said about what advisory looks like right now, um, students are in groups with 14 to 16 other students that Mr. Rice last year did a lot of work as a member of our faculty committee in developing an algorithm. And um, I cannot talk about how that works. Mr. Rice would have to explain the, the math behind that. That is not um, my strength or the side of my brain. Um, that is most dominant. Um, but this algorithm worked to give students as well as faculty some voice in how these groups were made. So these groups were not just made randomly or alphabetically. Um, you know, students did have some input in how these groups uh, were formed. And, and this year, um, all grades for the most part are following the same activity schedule. Um, and we're focusing on really two main areas this year. One being team building and relationship building. And the other being the idea that we're, we're focusing on training these student leaders to make advisory, um, again, not just student driven, but student run. So that the goal will be um, throughout the rest of this year and into next year, um, starting with seniors and then trickling down to underclassmen um, through the spring and into next fall uh, that advisory activities as much as possible are created by and led in advisory with faculty supervision by students. Um, and I see that um, Melissa Boletto is on this meeting as well and that she's on the agenda to talk later on today. Um, and Madison Youth and Family, uh, we've been working with them to develop a training that is somewhat similar to peer advocates, but that is geared specifically to um, the skills that these student leaders will need to, you know, one set examples as student leaders in our, our community because um, students leading by example is an incredibly powerful thing. Um, and also to have the, the, the skills to be able to um, problem solve and, and lead activities within their advisory groups. Um, after this year, um, and, and, and later on this spring as well, um, we are gonna move into um, some uh, activities and lessons that are different per grade that are targeted at more age appropriate and, and things based on student feedback that are specific um, to say seniors or specific to freshmen because those needs are a little bit different. But we are um, guiding the activities and the focus of advisory, not just on student input and data that we have gotten from here, but also on um, CASEL frameworks and CASEL is a, a national group that was formed back in the, the 90s with a focus on um, social and emotional learning. Um, they do research um, to support programming um, and inform legislation all around social and emotional learning. And um, we are, are using their guidelines of categories of self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision-making um, and driving our um, activities and advisory lessons. I'll turn it over to Ron again. Yeah, I could just build a little bit off of what uh, Mrs. Kennedy said about uh, the student leadership component. Um, what, you know, what we really wanted was for the students to have as much of an authentic experience as they could in advisory. And, and there's no better way to do that than to have the students you know, involved in the in some of the development and delivery of of activities that, that are appropriate for them, um, and so uh, we're doing a team building activity um, November 9th at Camp Hazen uh, for seniors, um, and then we're doing the um, leadership training with Madison Youth and Family Services on the 17th. Um, so our our main goal is to give them the skills that they're going to that will be required to, to help deliver some of those activities. And then we'll find ways within the lessons to either get those leaders engaged in their own advisories or even have them go and pair with some underclassmen and, and you know, sort of be like a role model in terms of 
um, a, an upperclassman, a leader and an upperclassman just to give the underclassmen a sense of what it's like to be in that kind of position. Because our, our goal is again, to train the underclassmen in subsequent sessions. Um, and I, I think that uh, that's about it. You have anything else to add, Mrs. Kennedy? Any questions that we can answer? And so we appreciate the explanation. I would anticipate that Mr. Spears and Ms. Kennedy will be back to a few PTO meetings as we move forward, because we're certainly committed to our advisory program and it's been nice to see the success thus far. And we're certainly working as we, this is kind of the building the plane while we're flying it, but the plane is flying, which is really exciting. And it's nice to see the students engaged with smaller groups of faculty and focused on relationship building, especially after the impact of the pandemic when we either were not in school or when we were in school, we had to try and enforce the social distancing and masks that made it very challenging to have those positive relationships in a school setting. So great work, Mr. Spears, Ms. Kennedy, we really appreciate it and more to come on that topic for sure. So thank you both, you're welcome to stay as part of our PTO meeting, but I also know your teachers and have things to do during the day. So we won't take it the wrong way if you have to log off. And now smooth transition. Melissa Boletto is always invited to our PTO meetings representing Madison Youth and Family Services. We have a fantastic relationship, we being the school and Madison Youth and Family Services. Melissa typically will join an early in the year meeting to just share several of the different opportunities Madison Youth and Family Services offers students and families. In a lot of cases, students jump on as well and share. I believe Red Sullivan is available today. I did send Red the link. So there might be some students joining, but if there's a somewhat unannounced senior skip day today. So we are missing some seniors, unfortunately. But Melissa, we appreciate your time and I'm gonna give you as much time as you need to share what Madison Youth and Family has to offer and how you connect with our school. Perfect, thank you so much for having me again. Um, so we, we run a lot of programs within the school district, not just at hand, but from elementary school on up. Um, I do wanna give Red um, an opportunity to speak first, just in case he needs to leave to go to class or whatever it is that he's doing. I do appreciate Red coming on today, considering it is senior skip day. <laughs> um, so Red, I wanna give you an opportunity just to talk about a few of the programs that you are in that is run by Madison Youth and Family Services. Uh, yeah, so I'm here on, today on behalf of uh, GASP. Uh, which is the gender and sexuality program at hand, as well as Girls United. Um, so for GASP, one of the things that we're doing is we're working to make uh, hand more equitable and positive uh, cultural environment for uh, LGBTQ students. Um, so we're we're trying to do things like with the school administration to um, push the culture in the right way. And then uh, for Girls United as a club, we're working to um, work uh, with local groups um, to talk about like sexual assault and uh, par uh, domestic violence. Um, and we're just trying to help the community with that. Perfect, thank you, Red. I appreciate you coming on today. Um, so GASP also participated in a Pride Fest that happened a few weeks back within um, on the Green in Madison. So that was a really great turnout. Um, another thing we're working on on Girls United is we're starting, we're in, in the process of developing a mentoring program with girls at Polson. So high school girls would meet with girls at Polson um, once a week. So that is in the process of developing as well. Uh, we also run Peer Advocates, which um, was mentioned a, a little bit earlier. Uh, we are doing two trainings right now. Um, Justin Ziegler is running one and I'm running the other group. So that's exciting. Um, and then Roots is going through a little bit of a transition this year. Um, so now the this group is now charged with um, 
really creating projects, enhancing the school and community as a whole. So their next project is on election day. It's um, They're calling it Civic Duty Day. Since most of these kids in this group are not old enough to vote, we still want them to recognize that their voice still matters. So they're doing a bunch of different community service projects around town on that day. So even though it's a day off for them, they still are choosing to be involved and active in the community. Um, another thing uh, that I'm very proud of is last year we trained every student at hand and QPR, which is a suicide prevention program. Uh, it was a huge un undertaking, but a very important one. Uh, so this year we are now focusing just on the freshman classes. Uh, we already trained the freshman classes and the health classes for this trimester. So next trimester we will do um, the next three or four classes that are that are in the health classes. So we're very excited about that. In addition to training all the kids at the high school, we are also training a lot of community members. So we trained first responders, we've trained different churches, um, just really um, any, uh, we did a few community wide events that really anybody can attend. So we're really making a lot of, um, a lot of progress on that. Uh, in addition to all the stuff that we do at hand, Polson, we run a lot of similar stuff, but just obviously at Polson and, and not at hand. So, you know, we have girls groups, we have Rainbow Lounge, which is very similar to GASP, Peer Helpers, which is similar to Peer Advocates. Uh, we also run some girls groups and boys groups as, as well there. Um, one thing that I'm very excited about is uh, really collaborating with um, Mrs. Kennedy and, and Mr. Spears on this advisory training. So on the 17th, um, myself and three other of my coworkers will be uh, presenting workshops to those senior advisor leaders. Uh, and some of the topics that we are training them on is communication skills, listening skills, how to build a trust within a group, and what do they do if that trust is broken? How do they repair that? So it's more on facilitating and building trust and communication within a group. Um, and that will just help their advisory groups just be more cohesive and have them have more of a leadership role within that. Um, I won't go on and on because I can talk for hours about things that we do, but just two other parts of our Madison Youth and Family Services that a lot of people may not know about. Um, we also run a clinic. Uh, so we do counseling services for families in town. As you guys can imagine, um, uh, mental health is a, is a really big issue. Um, and right now we have 27 families on our waiting list, which we've never had before. So that's just something that we're really keeping an eye on. And also our social services numbers. Um, are about 120% over what they were before the pandemic. Um, so, you know, a lot of, lot of families in town um, really struggling uh, to make ends meet. And so we are trying our hardest to, to support those families as well. Um, so I think that might be all that I have if you guys have any questions for me. All right, Melissa, great presentation. I appreciate all Madison Youth and Family Services do for not only our school, but certainly for the community. Red, thank you as well for taking some time to share. You know, Melissa is easy to contact and mm -hmm. you know, certainly provides lots of support. We will most likely have Melissa and several students from Madison Youth and Family Services join some upcoming PTO meetings because they really focus their efforts on, you know, improving some aspect of life. And that has really been positive. So we appreciate the relationship. And Melissa, as always, I appreciate your time. Thank More you. More to come for sure. So now we have just two more remaining items. We have Jan Scott, who is our PTO president, is going to do some updates from the PTO. And then I'll give just a few updates on a few topics that we thought would be timely for today. So Jan, welcome. Thanks, TJ. Um, first, I just wanted to thank you, Mr. Salutary, for your 10 years at hand. You're celebrating your anniversary this 
month and we really appreciate all that you do. So thank you for that. Um, just a couple PTO things. Um, if you haven't already liked our Facebook page, um, we're gonna try to start posting some upcoming deadlines on that Facebook page, um, just to keep track of all the senior activities that are going on. I know that the yearbooks, the discount is still there to purchase a yearbook or um, to buy a graduation ad until November 18th. So if you haven't done that, you might wanna do that. Um, Night in Hand is still looking for volunteers. Um, they weren't able to attend the meeting today, but they asked me to just share that the Sign Up Genius link is on the Hand website, and um, they really are looking to get rolling on what they're going to be doing. So anyone who is willing to volunteer, if you're not familiar with it, it's a great night for the seniors, and, but it is a lot of work. So um, there's not... Um, there's a lot of opportunity left. So if you have a chance, please go out and look at the Sign Up Genius and sign up. There's different levels of volunteering. So uh, it's not totally cumbersome. There's some that are real easy. So just take a look at that. And then uh, a little early notice, but our student blood drive is December 20th. And um, so it's a great opportunity for students to go and give blood. The staff can give blood as well and PTO supports the blood drive by um, bringing in baked goods for, for the students to reward them for giving their blood and kind of get a snack before they go back to class. Uh, la the last couple of years, we haven't been able to have baked goods because of COVID restrictions. So we're excited to have um, the opportunity to bring brownies, cupcakes, whatever in. So look, uh, we will be sending out a sign up genius closer to the date asking for homemade baked goods. And 16-year-old um, students can uh, donate as well their blood this year. So uh, there'll be a form that they will need to have parental uh, a parental sign off on that. 17 and up can sign off themselves. But it's a great way if you don't, if your student doesn't, or your, your child doesn't know their blood type, it's a great way uh, for you to figure that out. I didn't know my children, so it was a good way to figure that out. Um, and then lastly, as you start your holiday shopping, which I can't believe it's already here, um, if you're using Amazon, we'd love for you to add the PTO um, as your Amazon Smile benefactor. We got a quarterly check of $56 last quarter, and so every little bit helps. So if you uh, want to go into your account and just add Daniel Ham PTO, that'd be great. Thank you. That's all I have. Great, Jen. Thanks for the ongoing support. Certainly appreciate it. And a lot of good things coming up. We'll talk more about the blood drive in our December PTO meeting as well, just because it's great timing and we usually have good participation. So I have a few updates. The first is around some money and cost associated with being a student at hand. But before I get into what we call class dues, I did want to mention the PTO makes a donation. This is pretty new and really exciting to each of the classes at Daniel Hand. So if you can put in your mind that every incoming class has two faculty members who are their advisors who follow them and work with them over their four years, when they start to plan things like proms, for example, when they enter hand as freshmen, their accounts are empty and you actually need funding pretty soon as a freshman class to secure venue dates for things like junior and senior prom. Those dates are usually secured by October of freshman year for junior and senior prom. So the PTO has just graciously donated $500 per class, which has been very helpful and $1,000 for incoming freshman class. Again, they start with no funds in their account and usually deposits for venues used to run around $500, but the cost of living has certainly moved upward. So those additional funds or new funds actually have been incredibly helpful. And we certainly appreciate those donations that benefit all students. The class dues, just to clarify a little bit, if you haven't gotten a letter from the class advisors for your students' particular grades, you'll get a letter about either 
please pay your class dues or thank you for paying your class dues. These are actually senior dues. We don't collect every single year. It's a $70 total. We haven't increased that number in my time here. And we offer it as early as freshman year. So if a parent and guardian just wants to get that payment out of the way or maybe pay 10 or $15 a year, the total we ask for is $70. Some families give more just as a donation. And some families, that's too much money. And we certainly support them with financial confidential support. But when you see the class dues request for that $70, please understand that it's not $70 per year. It's $70 for the entire four years. And we use those funds to cover things like cap and gowns that seniors get just before graduation. We also use those funds to pay for a graduation photo and frame, which is a somewhat new tradition where we take a professional picture as your student walks across the stage and shakes my hand and we mail those home to families a few weeks after graduation and there's also about a $500 amount that each class donates to the scholarship fund that funds senior scholarships that take place in June every school year. If there is additional money, and there usually is, those funds, those class dues, subsidize costs for things like senior brunch, senior prom, and the senior outing. The senior outing used to be like a cookout with burgers and hot dogs. And you know, because of COVID a couple of years ago, we couldn't get any shipments of hot dogs and hamburgers, but we were able to secure pizza trucks, which seems to be very popular, three or four times more expensive than the typical cookout, but seems to be very popular the last couple of years. So we have used some of those funds to support the senior outing. The, just some additional costs, just so everyone is aware, you know, the, each class will do some fundraisers and now that COVID is not having the impact it had a year or two ago. The old fundraisers like bake sales, for example, lots of car washes, you know, those are used by either classes, like a whole entire class or individual teams, for example, where those funds get deposited into account. But in addition to the $70 class dues, you know, if you have a senior, it's pretty typical to pay about $25 to $35 for a senior brunch. Prom tickets have gone up. They're pretty expensive now, about $100 per ticket for a prom. And then the senior outing could cost between $75 and $100 per student. Again, very costly, but we like to be transparent in what we use funds for and what parents will be asked to contribute. Other costs, if you have a senior, $60 for parking. That's for all three trimesters. If you want a yearbook, those are $85. And a senior transcript is a $10 fee. One thing worth noting is, I think it's fair to say it's pretty expensive to be a senior at hand. We do offer financial assistance when we send these, this communication home. And when we talk to students, we always will talk that anyone could contact me either in person, over the phone, via email. And we do have student activity funds from different things like something we get as a percentage based on yearbook or school photography sales. We put any of the percent contributions that we receive in a student activity account to support families where finances are a challenge. And senior yearbooks, I call every student down who's a senior who does not order a yearbook just to say, do you want one? And I, I do ask the uncomfortable question, you know, is a financial issue in, in that case, we purchase a yearbook for a student because we do think it's important that a senior has a yearbook. And you'd be surprised how many students really appreciate that and didn't want to ask their parents for an extra $85 for a yearbook. So we do pay a lot of attention to making sure seniors have all of the experiences that we hope they have and that finances are not challenging. And if they are, we offer a lot of support. So feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions about the financial piece, especially if there's a need. Like we don't ask crying questions. We just support students to make sure they participate in all of the activities that are offered, especially during that senior year. And we've been quite successful over the years. So that's just a quick explanation of class dues, which again, more appropriately would be referred to as senior dues. Does anyone have any questions on those? All right, and last two, just a as a reminder, 
The NIAS collaborative visit, you've been hearing a lot of that lately. NIAS stands for the New England Association of Schools and Colleges. That's the organization that visits public schools and colleges and based on a set of standards and pr principles will accredit a school or give an action plan required to meet your accreditation standards. Daniel Hand is currently accredited. We don't expect that to change. We have a visiting team coming to Hand tomorrow and on Thursday. We're excited for the visit. And we, it's taken about a year and a half to plan for this. It's quite extensive. We have two faculty members who are the NIASC advisors, Mr. Paul Mezik, Mrs. Jennifer Aguzzi. They are going to be attending the December PTO meeting to give you an update on all of the details from this visit. We're excited about it. If your students come home from school tomorrow or on Thursday and say there were some people in our classes, we didn't really know who they were. That's part of the process. The visitors will be in lots of classrooms observing instruction. You know, as it happens at Daniel Hand, they'll be observing our advisory lessons. They get here at about 7.15. They'll work until 10 o'clock tomorrow night. And then they're right back here at 7.15 and they'll exit the building at a about three o'clock on Thursday, and then we'll wait for a report that we should receive which within six months. But we're excited for the opportunity and a lot of planning has gone into place to get ready for tomorrow. And I think we're fully prepared. Any NIAS questions? All right, last but not least, this is just to mark your calendars, barring any school cancellations for any reason. We're already talking about end of trimester one dates and exams have been set. These would move if school happened to be canceled for like a snowstorm, for an example. But we have November 30th, December 1st, and December 2nd as the last three days of trimester one. As a result, those will be exam days. If you have been at hand for a little while as a parent, or if you're new, just as a reminder, those are shortened days that are from 725 to 1215. And there's two exams each day. So for example, on November 30th, students who have exams on or classes period one and two or period one or period two will take an exam for two hours during that period. Students do not need to attend school if they don't have a exam period, like if their study hall, for example, is period two and they have a biology class period one after their biology exam. If they have a ride home, they can leave early. If not, buses will be available. We are excited that we are able to actually keep the cafeteria open. It was more challenging during COVID because of so many students in one space, but the dining and assembly hall will be open in the early morning through 1030 on those days. And worth noting is in between the two exam periods, there's 30 minutes. So students who wanna grab a snack will have more than enough time to stop in the dining and assembly hall and grab something. School dismissal on those days is at 1215. And it's a, again, just an announcement because our next PTO meeting will happen after this has occurred. So I wanted to make sure parents were aware just for planning. And if there's ever any already planned event where you're traveling, please reach out to me sooner than later so we can make some plans with teachers and with your students so they can make sure they take their exams in a timely manner. We're usually very flexible, although we don't love doing that. We certainly understand life is important and sometimes there's some unavoidable things that take place. Any questions on the exams, dates, times? All right, so right at nine o'clock, that was excellent. I really wanna thank all the presenters today, did a great job, as well as everyone who was able to participate. I will be sending out this recording on Friday with my weekly message, and I just want to say thank you to everyone and have a great rest of your day.